Okay. Okay. Good morning. Um, so this is the fourth day of the fast multiple method uh, lecture, and today we will talk about different kinds of parallel uh, programming um, paradigms. And so the the title says domain decomposition, but first I want to introduce uh, the different types of parallel uh, programs or programming models that you can use inside your computer. So the typical ones that we use in uh, scientific computing are vectorization, threading, and distributed memory, uh, MPI programming. So what this is doing in terms of correspondence to the hardware is the first one, uh, the SIMD of, of vectors, are things that happen inside each of the CPU cores. So for one CPU, inside one CPU core, you can even do a, already a parallel operation by using uh, these vector uh, arithmetic units. So what a vector arithmetic unit does is it, it does in one, if you issue one operation, it can do the same, for example, addition on like four or eight numbers at the same time. So if the data goes into, so this, this is a, like a last level cache. So the data first goes uh, from the memory that looks like this. This one is on your motherboard. Then it can go into um, the L2 cache, which is already inside your um, chip. And then um, it goes into uh, the smaller caches that are inside the cores themselves. And uh, modern, so this is a Haswell Intel CPU, uh, the new ones, and they also have GPUs built in like this, but these are small GPUs, not the big GPUs that you can get from NVIDIA. And, and inside each of these CPU cores, you have like L2 and L1 cache. Uh, and so each of these um, CPU cores uh, has smaller and smaller data that you can store. So say this is like the pyramid of the size of data that you can store on each of these um, you know, memory hierarchy. Uh, and so if you have a hard disk, then you can store a lot of data. But the access can take you know, like 10 mil milliseconds. It's very slow. And then for like a RAM, like this one, the memory on your machine, the access is larger, but like typically one of these green things can store like eight gigabytes of data. And, and then you have like a cache that's smaller, and you have like L1 cache that's very small, L2 cache that's bigger, and L3 cache sometimes. And as the size gets smaller and smaller, the access speed gets faster and faster. And uh, the, the parallelization that happens up here is, you know, at the top of this uh, data structure. So in your um, registers, you have such things called uh, SIMD uh, registers. So uh, Intel CPUs or AMD CPUs, they have these uh, vector um, registers where you can store data in, um, you know, like units of four or eight. AVX um, is uh, one of the instructions that you can use on Intel or AMD uh, CPUs to um, issue vector instructions. So in, in essence, it can calculate in one operation eight numbers if it's single precision and four numbers if it's double precision. Um, so that's why it has um, uh, you know, the extra parallelism can be achieved uh, from this SIMD vectorization. So that's like at the top of the um, parallelization list. Then um, going down, so for each of these CPUs, CPU, you know, this chip, on each chip you have many cores nowadays. So for, to do different instructions on these different cores, um, so the key here is the first one, you have to do the same instruction. So SIMD is single instruction, multiple data. So you can't do different things on the different re vector registers. They need to do the same operation. 
So this form of parallelism is a little bit restrictive. Um, so you can't do different things um, on the parallel, uh, the, the different parallel instructions. So this one, you can actually do different things in the different threads. Um, and you have like uh, access to the same uh, memory. So for example, you have like a shared cache and also you have like a, um, same access to the same memory on your computer. So in this case, it's called the shared memory parallelism. So you can do different instructions, but also um, the fact that the data is shared means that you can access any part of the data during your parallel operation. So you just need to uh, worry about uh, reading and writing to the same location in the data because if you, you can't really control which thread runs faster than the other one. So you have these race conditions where you think you're reading some data that some other person wrote, but maybe this person hasn't finished writing yet, so then you're accessing old data and your calculation gives the wrong results. So the thing you need to be careful here when you're programming an OpenMP is you're accessing all of these cores are doing um, different calculations potentially, but they all access through this memory hierarchy the same data in this RAM. So uh, you need to be careful about um, the data access, where, what data you're accessing, and um, to avoid any uh, race conditions. Uh, then you have um, MPI, which sort of goes outside um, one single node. So a large computer is not just one of these nodes. It has many, many. So this is, well, you can think of it as some offline storage, but it's actually not offline storage. It's uh, like another computer that's connected to you through um, either Ethernet or InfiniBand uh, network. And so you're accessing data that's on a different um, one of these boxes. It's in a different physical uh, node. And when you do that, it's no longer shared memory because this memory here you can't access if it's on another machine. You have to do some kind of communication. Uh, you, you need to write inside your code, not just some uh, reference to, you know, like array A. It can't fetch array A if it's on another machine. So you need to do something like MPI, I send, I receive, or some, some MPI uh, function you need to call so that it actually goes to the other machine and gets that data. So there are ways to do this. So the, the reason why there are so many different ways of programming a parallel, um, you know, uh, in parallel is because these all operate at different levels of the computer and according to, you know, how the hardware is designed, they have different specifications. So for example, the top one, you can only issue the same instruction on all the data. You can't have different things do different, you know, you can't have different data um, operate on different um, instructions. But here, you can actually do different things on the different cores. That's, that's allowed. And if you don't use this, even on a multi-core machine, you'll only be using one core. So you, you'll be wasting all your, if you had 20 core machine, uh, you'd be using only one, so that's a waste. So this one, um, you need to use so that you can utilize all your cores on a multi-core machine. This one, you need to use when you are running on a big machine with multiple nodes. So um, all, all these things uh, depend on what kind of machine you are running on. And just to give you a simple example of what the code will look like to use these things, and MPI I'm going to describe later because it, it's a bit more complicated. I can't just show it in a few lines. So. Um, for, for say that you have like a loop that calculates for an array of eight elements, it just adds B plus A and puts it into C. So this kind of calculation. Say, say that you used, wanted to use AVX. Uh, you can do it in a number of ways, but um, the, the typical way is to use this uh, thing called the intrinsic function, which uh, you, know, you have a header file that you can add, like include, um, you know, something xmm intrin dot h, and then you have, uh, you can call these functions. So 
Now it gives you a definition of a type called M256. This is a 256-bit um, float, num uh, like a single precision floating point number, which contains eight elements. So A already contains what's worth uh, A0 from A7, like eight numbers it contains in this one value. And then B and C you define in the same way, and then you input some numbers, and then when you want to add them, you call this function. So instead of doing a plus, you need to use this special function. But then it does, instead of just adding two numbers like we're doing up here, it adds all these numbers at once. And so if you write your code like this, it can be potentially eight times faster because um, inside the Intel chip, it's actually using only one uh, arithmetic um, uh, trans, you know, like a unit to, not necessarily a transistor, but it uses a couple of transistors to, to actually issue this operation and operate at once on all these data. And so um, when you do OpenMP to do the same thing, it's much easier. You take the original loop, you add this one line to your code, pragma OMP parallel 4. And then when you compile, instead of GCC, you know, step 1.c, you put GCC dash F open MP uh, step 1.c. You just add some um, compiler option that uses open MP into GCC. And GCC after I think 4.3 uh, supports open MP. So you, if, it, if it's a GCC version that's after 4.3, you can just add the flag F open MP without adding anything extra. Ah, you do need to add the header file. So you do, in the beginning of your program, you need to add include uh, omp.h. And then you can issue this command. And then what this will do is, first, before it hits this line, it will be executing everything on one core. But then when it sees this command, pragma omp parallel 4, then it's going to run four threads. So one thread, each thread uses one core. So you can think of thread as being mapped to uh, a physical core on the hardware. And the thing called hyperthreading, maybe some of you may have heard of hyperthreading on, on Intel chips, that runs two threads on one physical core. So, so that's, um, you can have double the number of threads uh, acting quite efficiently on, you know, like half the number of physical cores that you have on the machine. So, this this is like a fork called a fork and join model. So here it's like it looks like a fork. You fork the operation into four threads, and then you join here. Once the loop finishes, it becomes a serial execution again. So every time you hit a loop, it forks and then joins and forks and joins. And so if your parallel region contained only like a two, or you know if you only did something so that two threads are created, then it would look like you know from four and then two and then three. So the number of threads that run uh, can differ, and you can actually control that inside uh, OpenMP by by setting OMP um, set OMP um, num threads inside the code. Also, you can control it from environment values of the same name, and also so th these two are quite easy to program once you know how. Um, so today in the hands-on, maybe we can just add this to one of our loops and see, see how fast it gets. If you run your code like a.out with uh, command time space uh, a.out, then it will report the time it took to run your code. So we will put this instruction in and see if it really accelerates in our hands-on. We can do that very easily. Okay, so now, now comes this difficult one. So th this one is not so easy to just rewrite your code into. So a, a lot of people have um, to learn how to um, write MPI code. And, and the problem is, so this is what domain decomposition is. So I, I explained to you, you know, the FMM tree structure. So now you know uh, what you have on, on the, um, on each, each of the, um, if you're running this whole thing on one node, then you know what you're running, um, and you can see the whole thing. The thing is, if you're using MPI, you create this thing called ranks. So each of the nodes, each of the processes, MPI processes, 
um, that you create on each node um, are numbered by this thing called rank. So rank 0 and rank 1 and rank 2. Say that you had three nodes and you're running MPI on the three, three different nodes of your um, system. And then you had three ranks, rank 0, rank 1, and rank 2. And now you're looking at rank 1. So this is my rank, your current rank. And then you want to see the data on the other nodes, but these are, are different motherboards. So the, the RAM on these motherboards, you can't access from this CPU directly. So MPI does um, the communication between the nodes through your Ethernet cable or InfiniBand cable, and it, it has all the protocols to issue these instructions to communicate, send data from one um, memory system to another memory system on a remote machine. Um, you, you don't even have to have the machines in the same room. You can, you can communicate, you know, like MPI on a machine that's in another country. This is also possible through the internet. But um, typically, you have in a supercomputer, all your nodes are in the same room. And then they're connected with very fast, like, uh, you know, optic fiber cables and, and more sophisticated network topology. So it's not like, you know, one, one wire is connected to one big switch and then there's a... So you need to partition your domain. It doesn't matter how you part There are many ways to partition. So I'm describing different ways to partition your domain so that if you had three processes running in, in MPI, each of these different colors would be on the different nodes of, of, your, of your computer. And so you need to think carefully first how to partition your original problem. And this is called domain decomposition. So this is not just a problem for FMM. It's a problem if you're running finite difference methods or you know, um, any kind of numerical scheme uh, that stores data, basically. Then your data will be stored on the different nodes. So you need to somehow find out a way to have a nice partition. So what is a nice partitioning method? Um, it, it's what minimizes the amount of communication. So if you partition it in a, in a very strange way, uh, like say you had uh, the red going like this, and then if your blue was going like this and around, and your green was a strange shape, then you'd have to potentially communicate a lot of cells amongst each other. Because um, So the concept that we use for fast multiple method communication is called the local essential tree. So what is the local essential tree? It's a subset of the tree that your local uh, rank requires. Um, and so you have the whole tree. This, this is the whole tree in the entire domain on all the nodes. But this green rank doesn't need these white ones because so remember the interaction list in the M2L. For, for the large nodes, you accessed far away. But for the close nodes, you only needed your neighbors. That means these white bo byte boxes, you don't need to send. You can just leave on the other machine and not, never access. So the, the key to having an efficient partitioning method is to sort of minimize these red boxes that you need to send and also minimize these blue boxes that you need to send. And once you have these, these red ones sent and blue ones sent, you construct a tree that is essential you know, to your local calculation. So this is called the local essential tree. It's all the subsets of the remote trees that you needed to calculate, do your local calculation. So it's what every, every MPI rank needs. And so typically, in a fast multiple method calculation, you, you, do, you first need to determine what to send to the other boxes. And so uh, you, well, the first thing you need to do is partition, OK? So without the partitioning, um, you, you don't, everyone has everything. So it, it's like, um, 
you know, not, not parallel. So, of course, you can use MPI to do something like OpenMP, and you, know, you, can, you can redundantly store in MPI the same thing on all nodes, and let just this green node calculate only you know, this colored part and not the white part. So you can, you can do that. But then, what happens in the next step? In the next step, um, every uh, rank 0, rank 1, and rank 2 will have done their local calculation in parallel. Um, and these nodes that are local will get updated um, because you only do this part. You know, the data is stored redundantly on all machines, but you have only successfully updated this part. So uh, the other parts become outdated. So storing everything redundantly on all the ranks doesn't really help you uh, avoid the communication in the end because the data that you stored Unless you do the same calculation everywhere, but then it's not parallel. You're doing the same data and the same calculation on all machines. Uh, that's not going to speed up the calculation at all. So to speed up the calculation, and if you stored redundantly all your data, you have to operate on a subset of the data to save time. But then if you only operate on the subset of the data, only the subset of that data you operated on gets updated. And so you need to propagate that updated information to the other nodes, which is equivalent to the communication you had to do anyway in the beginning had you partitioned the domain. So the proper way to use MPI is to actually uh, partition the domain and communicate only what you need. So to do that, first you need to partition um, the domain into some shape. So the, the Morton index that we discussed is actually a very nice way of determining um, how to partition. So you follow the Z curve. So a Z curve is drawn. Uh, you can see it in the uh, very um, uh, thin line. Uh, it, so if you follow it, then the, if, you, if you pull this uh, space filling curve and turn it into one single line, if you want to chop your domain into three equal segments, the best thing to do is actually chop this space filling curve this long line, if you draw it into a straight line, you chop it into three equal segments. And then you, you shrink that back into this shape, it will look like this. So you, you, you're equally, you're chopping the space filling, you're following the space filling curve and chopping this line into three equal segments. Um, so if you had a big box here, you count this length of this line as just one box. That's why this blue domain looks large, because it has many big boxes. But you're, you're chopping this uh, space filling curve into equal segments in terms of number of boxes, not, not the size of the domain. So you, you, these and these and these have roughly equal number of boxes. We're not looking at the size. We're looking only at the number of boxes. So that's why this is an equal partitioning. And this, this happens. Uh, and this is a good way to partition because according to the criteria we discussed of how you divide the boxes, you divide the boxes so that each box contains roughly the same number of points, a constant number of points. So the, this box is big, but has only the same number of points as this small box. So the number of computations it happens at this box should be roughly similar to this, this small box here. And that's why you only need to divide the space filling curve by the number of boxes and not worry about the size. And so. When you do that with Morton indexing, or the Hilbert indexing that goes like this, um, then you, you get a different kind of, slightly different kind of uh, partitioning. But, but still, it's well balanced, and you get uh, a nice partition. Um, this one is called the orthogonal recursive bisection. What this one does, it doesn't use a space filling curve at all. What it does is it, it first looks at this side and this side of the partition, and says, um, how many particles are on this side and this side? So if you had three ranks, actually it's, it's not as easy. So if you had four, it's easy. You chop in, into equal segments on, on this side and this side, and then do it again on this side and this side. If you have three, you need to do the first partition so that this side has twice as much as this side, and then you chop this into two equal segments. But in the end, this is not following a space filling curve. It's trying to balance the total number of particles in each domain. But 
since the calculation load is somewhat proportional to the number of particles in, in your domain, uh, you, you can get a good balance with even this one as well. The, the problem is it doesn't align well with uh, the underlying tree structure. So see that this part here, the, the underlying tree structure has this big box here. But this sits on both the green uh, rank and the blue rank. So potentially, you might have a lot of communication if you use this kind of partitioning with the tree structure. And so there, there's another type of orthogonal recursive bisection which uh, doesn't chop the oak tree so that it um, misaligns with uh, a partition. It actually tries to shrink the box size so that all the particles fit in this box, but um, they sort of align with the partition of the orthogonal recursive bisection. So you, you have different ways of doing um, the tree construction. And so th this is, if you do it this way or this way or this way, you have a local essential tree that looks like this. And these nodes, these big nodes here, like uh, this one here, is shared by blue and green. This one is shared, this big node here, is shared by red and green. So you can see that these are shared. If you do it this way, then until you reach the sort of root of your subtree, of your local node, uh, you don't share anything. So you can just construct everything locally and then just graft the tree finally at the end. Uh, you just create like a three-branched big tree that connects all your local subtrees. So there are advantages and disadvantages to using um, these different types of partitionings. So this is how you do domain decomposition in, in uh, the fast multiple method. What? Yeah, yep. Sorry. So in your previous slide, uh, you mentioned that the, the white nodes are something that's uh, not related to others. Mm. But, but what, uh, what about those uh, uh, red dots? Is that why, I mean, the lower uh, left, uh, left, mm. uh, yeah, yeah, something. Yeah, that's white. But how about the red one? Why it is related to others? This one? Yeah, or something like that. Yeah. So th this one, uh, because of the interaction list at higher levels of the FMM, maybe I can show you an example. So yeah, I need to go back to the the previous lectures. So I showed in one of the. You, you just need to remember the interaction list on, for the multi-level FMM. So say that you partitioned your domain like this. So for, for the smaller levels, you only need the information from nearby. Yeah. And, but once you go here, you need the information that's on another MPI rank. And then if you go up here, you need information from, that's on a very far MPI rank. So if, when you go up, you start to need more and more from far away nodes. And so, yeah, it, it's, you, can, you can think of the corresponding picture for, um, for this. Yeah, so think of, think, compare these two, and you will see. So think of these two red ones as these ones here, and think of this red one up here as these ones here. So the higher you go, the further you need uh, the information. Okay. So, so this is the partitioning. And once you partition, then you need to find out what to communicate. So, well, th this is the same. Again, I, I should have kept the previous slide because it was showing a nice... Um, Where's well, you, you can just remember what I was just showing. So uh, if, say that you have a very deep tree like this. Okay, level starts from 0, 1, 2, and then goes all the way down. And this is on rank 0 and rank 1, and your tree goes on and on for many levels. So at the very top, for the M2L interaction, you need these boxes here because... Remember, the criteria was your parents, neighbors, children that are not your neighbors. So 
you, you don't go further than your parents' neighbors. So you only need, so say that you are these green boxes here, you only need at least this red region. So th you need to communicate this part here for the M2L communication. Uh, for the M2M to create um, the multiple expansion at this big node from the ones that are small, like these four, you need the information, say that you only have this green part and these are on remote nodes. Then these three you need to send to construct this big one here. So this is the communication that's needed for the M2M uh, computation. And then uh, you also need to do, at the bottom level, you need to do a P2P communication. So again, uh, for that, you only need your neighbor um, boxes. And so here, you have your neighbors already locally. So it's only when you're at the boundary of your um, node that you need things from other nodes for the P2P. But it's always one box, because it's always a neighbor. You only need one layer of halo. So it, for people who do like finite difference calculations in MPI, um, if you're familiar with that, this is like the halo communication you need for finite differences on, on MPI. So, but FM, so you can think of FMM as a multi-level halo <laughs> uh, method. So it needs halos, not at just the bottom stencil level, but it has multi-level stencils. So as you go up the tree, your halo uh, gets bigger and bigger. And so the amount of communication you need to do eventually is um, your, your whole domain. Because say that you've reached the top level, uh, like here, level two, you, you, you need, so two boxes from your parent is actually the whole domain already. So these levels need information from other boxes at, you know, uh, the whole domain. But you only need one box, for example. For, for level one, um, these are just four boxes for a 2D problem. So you only need information from the other three. So, but it needs to get sent from all the other nodes in your, that are in your calculation. So um, the amount of communication you need to do is small, but you still need to send it from the, you know, every other node at the higher levels of the tree. If you're at the lower levels of the tree, it's the other way around. The amount of communication you need to do here is, is quite large, but you only need to communicate with the eight neighbors that are um, surrounding you. So the amount of people you talk to is small, but the amount you need to send is large for the lower domains. So that, that's, that's the amount of communication um, that you need to do in MPI, uh, if you do MPI in FMM. Yes. Yeah? Oh, yes. Uh, it's for both. So you. So you. If you, if you're using um, a link list based tree, you still can use the Morton index. You 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 generate a Morton index to do this partitioning part only. And then, yeah, yeah, only one time in the partitioning you use the Morton index. You don't use it for the tree. So, and then for each of, say you have this red part and green part and blue part, to construct this green tree and red tree and blue tree, you use the linked list. So, so these are linked. But then, so because you mentioned, I, I'll describe a little bit more so that it, it answers um, more comprehensively your question. So. When you, once you create the linked list, what you do in the linked list version uh, in parallel is um, you need to create the link between these remote um, trees when they, when they arrive. So because um, before you communicate, they're, they're not linked, right? You, you just, only, only this part is linked in your tree. So you, the, these branches don't exist um, until you do the communication. So it happens in th three stages. So first you create the local tree and link them. And then 
you, you find these remote um, branches. You can either do this by traversing the tree, the linked list, for uh, you know, assuming that the remote trees are full and asking for the information uh, to send the remote nodes. And then once it arrives, you link them. You, you sort of um, graph them to your tree. So Yes, exactly. So first you do the domain decomposition, create a local linked tree, and then send the information from the remote nodes. So either way, the communication is required, but what happens after the communication is different for the linked uh, tree version. So that after the information arrives, uh, to index them, uh, you, you can just index if you're using an index tree. But if you're using a linked tree, you need to go through the process of starting from the parent and creating the parent-child link once, it, once the information arrives. But that's, that can happen very fast on your computer. The, the more expensive part is actually the communication. So you don't need to worry about you know, creating the linked tree uh, being expensive operation. So uh, now, uh, what happens, so I described a somewhat uniform tree. So in this case, this was like a uniform tree. We assume that it's full uh, because when I'm asking for these red boxes in the remote nodes, I'm sort of assuming that they exist. But so what happens if you're doing an adoptive tree and your tree looks like this? Um, when you part, do the domain decomposition, uh, you, know, you don't know what's on the remote node. And if your tree is adoptive, then you have a problem where you don't even know if that branch exists, but you still have to request something because in terms of the multiple to local um, uh, stencil, the, uh, the interaction list says, if that box was there, I need that information. So you need to send um, information based on the assumption that someone will need your information. And that's sort of the way uh, you know, the communication is done in the FMM is that um, if, you're, if you're on this branch here, then you know your, your local tree is empty in this area. So it's better for you to send than for someone to ask for someone to send their information. Because if you're, if you're here and you're asking, if you want to ask this part of the domain to send information, you may ask for too much because you don't know that this part is empty. And so w what you do is, instead of like a request-based uh, sending, you, you do like a push, you know, sort of like a sender-based uh, uh, communication, not, not a requester-based communication. And so you, you know what you have, so you assume that the other person needs whatever you have, and so you end up not sending any of this empty stuff because you know that you don't have it. And so that, that's sort of the model you use for the non-uniform case uh, for communication. And so, um, well, this, this is about the amount of communication you do. So we, we saw in the previous picture that the M2L communication requires um, 26 neighboring boxes and you had eight boxes locally. And so you're communicating eight cells per process. And the amount of communication is for, you have log P levels in your global tree. If you had P processes, you have log P processes. So the, this is about the communication complexity of the global communication. And for the local communication, you're always only communicating with um, a constant number of processes. So this part is order one, uh, but the amount of communication you do per process is uh, like a um, surface to volume ratio of the amount of um, particles you have per process. So if you have P processes and if you have in total N points, you, your domain decomposition would probably partition it into equal segments. So you have N over P uh, points per node, and then this uh, two to the two 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 thirds power is um, the sort of surface to volume ratio, meaning that it takes that halo region, and the halo region has this complexity. It's like the surface of a volume. 
um, that if your volume was n over p, the surface would have n over p uh, to the two-thirds power. And so the amount of communication can be written like this. If you add all this up, uh, the, the total complexity is log p plus n over p to the two-thirds. And in, in the non-uniform case, you don't have the full eight. You have some number like seven or six, and this number could be like 25 or 24, but it's still of order one. So you just replace these constants with an order one, and, and it doesn't really change the overall complexity because the full tree is the worst case. You need to have to send the most information um, when the tree is full. But it, it's not necessary. it's like the worst case uh, for amount of communication. So now, um, we, talk about, we, we talked about the different ways of partitioning using the Morton curve or Hilbert curve, um, but there are other wit tools that you can use. For example, you can use a graph partitioning tool. These are used to partition finite element meshes or finite difference meshes uh, when you're solving PDEs. And you can use similar tools like Metis or Parmetis um, to partition uh, your graph. So you can think of this FMM tree as a graph. And so each of the nodes requires communication from each other. So the M2L translation is like a connected edge between these nodes. And so when you want to minimize the communication, you want to minimize uh, the edge cuts of um, these connected edges between the nodes because each edge represents a communica potential communication. If you cut it and put it on a different node, then that, to connect those two lines again, you need to communicate. So the, the le less number of edges you cut in this graph, the better. So what graph partitioning tools do is they minimize the number of edge cuts. It, and they try to um, balance the number of nodes in each of the partitions. So say that I wanted to partition this in three, into three partitions. It will try to do like three, three, and two so that it balances out the number of nodes. And then it tries to find the shape where the number of edges it cuts to balance this into three, three, and two is minimized. So the number of edge cuts is minimized uh, by this tool. And that, in turn, minimizes the number of uh, things you need to communicate. Because the edges you did not cut means that they are in the same uh, node and they don't need to be communicated. So only the edges that were cut result in communication. And if you minimize the number of edges that were cut, then that minimizes the communica uh, communication. So you can use these tools. There, there are some um, types of FMM that use graph partitioning tools to do this partitioning part. OK, so a little bit more on the non-uniform parallelization. So if you do Morton ordering, again, if you partition into four points, and say that your point distribution had a shape that looks like this. And so it's not completely symmetric. So you have parts that sort of hang out like this. And this blue part is actually, because the Morton ordering is like a Z curve, and here the Z jumps from here to here, you have like one blue part here and the rest of the blue parts here. So if you think about what this blue um, box needs, it, if you, you, it needs to send information from this yellow neighboring uh, node and also this green neighboring node. And also this blue part needs to send from this red node. So it results in a lot of communication. Basically, the surface area of your domain is proportional to the amount of communication, roughly. So you want to minimize the surface volume ratio. So give, given a particular volume, which is um, how you partition, you want to uh, balance the volume of your domains. So you can't really control the volume. You want to minimize the surface. So it, it, you want your shape of your partition to be as close to a sphere or a, a square uh, well, more, more a sphere as possible so that it minimizes the surface area um, because the surface area is proportional to the amount of communication you need to do. So you don't want to do Morton ordering too much because this um, jump creates more communication. If you do like a orthogonal recursive bisection, then um, you don't have like this jump. So 
Um, uh, but you, you have that misalignment with the underlying tree. So then that uh, increases the communication. You can also, so this is how you determine the equation to determine um, which boxes to send. So uh, because you have like a um, um, ratio between the box size, so you say that you had a box size L and then your source had a box size LJ and the distance was R, remember that the theta value was um, the opening angle was what decided um, if these two boxes can be approximated with the far field M2L approximation or not. So you, you use this to determine what to send. You use the same criteria that you use to determine if it um, should interact. The same criteria is used to determine if it should be sent from a remote node. And so you just use these types of different um, criteria. But to construct the local essential tree, we don't do it cell by cell. So we, we um, interact with, it's hard to see the, uh, well, actually, you're, you're seeing pretty much what you need to. Um, so this is just a, the remote domain. So if, if you know the shape of the remote domain, like it, it has, uh, if you're following the space filling curve, you can determine the exact shape because if you know the beginning and end index of, of the Morton index or Hilbert index, then you can just draw the shape and you know, you know the exact bounds of this domain, remote domain. So at least this information you have in the beginning. You, you can assume that you have uh, the begin index and end index of each node, uh, of each partition of the uh, Morton index. And then uh, you use that information to determine the distance, not from each box, but from the domain itself. Uh, the domain boundary itself. And this is valid because only the closest ones uh, have the strictest um, uh, criteria for sending. So, for example, if you're, if you're looking at this close one and it says you should send this box, then um, you, the ones very far from you, they don't usually need this box. So. It's only, you only need to look at the strictest criteria to determine if you need to send it or not. And, and that's always at the boundary. Uh, the ones that are far away or inside, you don't need to look at because they'll, they'll say they don't need this box. But it's always the boundary that asks for um, you to send this because it's closer, basically. So you only need to follow the domain boundary to determine what to send. So that when you construct this kind of algorithm, um, you know, for MPI, you just have to make sure you, s you look at the boundary um, and determine the distance and determine what to send. And so you don't need to examine everything against everything to, to determine what to send. So it's, you don't need to do that many calculations. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is the end of the first part of the domain decomposition. I'll talk a bit more about uh, the local essential tree in the next um, session. And um, maybe, maybe we shouldn't, pr can we proceed a little bit more? Or, um, because there's not too much more. Well, I guess there is a little bit more. But um, because we have, or no, we, we should stop at 10, right? Is that the official? This lecture is from 9, 10 to 10. So, OK. Uh, no, no. Uh, I, I was, maybe we should just stick to the original timeline. Because um, today's hands-on is about uh, parallel coding. But we won't do, I don't think we will do MPI. We'll, we'll just do the OpenMP or SIMD uh, vectorizations. Uh, because you can do that quite easily. Um, MPI, you actually need. Uh, multi-node machine. So you can't just run it on your local workstation. Uh, well, I guess you can. You, you can run it on your local workstation uh, by sort of doing a fake communication I inside the same node, which is usually not necessary, but you can still um, pretend that you're accessing two different nodes, um, but still on the same node. So we will do OpenMP in today's hands-on. 
And I'll describe to you how uh, to do GPU uh, kernels in the last part of this next talk. So that any, if any of you want, are interested in GPU programming, I'll, I'll give you some idea of um, how, how to change your code so that it runs on GPUs. Uh, okay? Okay.